Hello again, it's Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour, and uh, I guess we all made it through Christmas all right, even though this may be downloaded later. Now we're looking forward to uh, New Year's. This is the 30th of December, Friday, so we only have one more day left in 2005. Then we go into a whole new year. It really seems hard to believe that it's been a whole year has gone by already. But they do say time is speeding up and everything is getting faster. And I believe it because this whole year has been a big one for me with all the traveling. And I'm already booking through most of 2006, so uh, it's probably going to go fast also. But let me give out the telephone numbers before we begin. Anyone who wants to call in, the number in the United States is 1-888-268-4313. 1-888-268-4313. And the international number for those who are listening overseas, although I always think it's in the middle of the night over there, but you never know. But the ones overseas, if they want to call in on other countries, it's 1-281-419-7697. Okay. One thing I wanted to say before I forgot about it, you know, a few weeks ago, I told you I had come back from Dubai in the Middle East, where I was over there for 10 days, and I got back here right before Thanksgiving, and I was talking about how the sheikh over there was putting billions and billions of dollars into building this wonderful new city of skyscrapers that's just sprouting out of the desert. Well, now I have found that, I guess, one of the neighboring countries I don't know if they're jealous or they think there's competition or what there is, but the sheikh in Saudi Arabia is now going to do the same thing. And it was on the Internet. He's supposed to be putting 40 to $50 billion of his own oil money into building a huge city on the coast by the water in Saudi Arabia. Well, I found that on the Internet, it has a picture of the proposed city. It's also going to have skyscrapers. It's going to have all of the luxuries and the things that are occurring now in Dubai. And it says there would be 500,000 new jobs generated. Now, whether that's in the construction or if that is afterwards or not, but it sounds like they're all going modern over there. And they are building totally new, wonderful cities that are going to surpass anything. And I also had news on the Internet that the Dubai, where I was at, is one of the buildings they are building is going to be the tallest building in the world. So I think this is the place to watch. The Middle East is not what we think it is. I guess we always think of them as living in tents in the middle of the desert, and, uh, you know, hoarding the gold money, the uh, oil money, and living in these palaces. But actually, there's a lot more going on over there than you think. And all the companies in the world, the major corporations, are going to relocate into these big cities. They are building corporate headquarters in many of these huge cities. So that's going to be interesting. I don't know how many of you know that the tallest building really in the world, I think there's an argument about it, is in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And I saw that when I was over in Bali. We had to go through Kuala Lumpur. It's twin uh, buildings. I guess you would call them twin towers because they are like pointed on the top. But there's two of them side by side, and they are joined with connecting bridges. Are connecting walkways, I guess you would say, on several of the floors crossing over from one building to the other. And they say the two of them are supposed to be the tallest buildings. But um, I don't know if there's an argument with that over the Sears Tower, or which one really is.
But they said in the one in Kuala Lumpur, you can live your entire life in those buildings and never even have to go outside on the street. Everything they need is right there, schools, hospitals, uh, stores, everything. So things are amazing things are happening in that part of the world. We always focus on the war, but there is a lot of very constructive things going on, too. So I think this will be interesting to watch what's going to happen in Saudi Arabia because that is where a lot of the oil money is. And we all know where that oil money is coming from. It's coming from a lot of our own pockets, the profits that they're making on that. But at least it's good to know that they're taking the profits and using it in a constructive way. They are not hoarding it. They are building huge metropolises and huge cities. Because, I said before, you can even go skiing over there in the middle of the desert. They have these places in Dubai that was the... Uh, snow dome and inside of that you can even live in there they have quarters where you can live in there if you wanted to live among snow-capped mountains and skiing and some people said why would I want to go to the desert and then go skiing but it's like they've let their imagination run wild and anything is possible over there so I'm going to be watching that part of the world because they do want me to come back and uh, now that my books have been introduced over there, they said they expect them to take off all throughout the Middle East. And even though they had a censor board, that had to okay the books before they were brought in. But now I'm in the middle of planning my next trip to uh, Europe and to Asia. I'll be returning over there the end of February and be gone the whole month of March. I have to speak at the International Hypnosis Conference in New Delhi, India. And on that trip, I'm going to get to see the Taj Mahal. So I do take time off to have a little fun, too, to have a little vacation and play, too. I don't like to just have all work. That's that's going to be a new first one for me is to go to India. Then I'll be back to Russia and to Holland. So we're trying to put those trips all together now. So I'll have many interesting things to tell you about the trips and about the talks and the classes that I'm giving everywhere. But uh, right now, I guess we're all looking forward for New Year's, and this is the time of the year that I'm home for a while, because I live in the mountains, and when it snows here in Arkansas, we can have some pretty bad winters, and when it snows, I can't get to the airport. They may clean off the highways, but they don't clean off these back roads that go up into the mountains. So sometimes it's difficult to get into down the highway to get over to Fayetteville where I can get the airport to uh, get the planes. So years ago, I stopped booking anything this time of the year rather than take the chance. So wouldn't you know, we've been in the 60s now here for the last two weeks. I think it's like that a lot of parts of the United States. There isn't any winter right now. They say, what's happening? We've gone right into spring and summer. Well, everything is changing with the weather and all of it. But anyway, that's why I'm home right now, and I can do the shows live. When I get ready to go overseas again, then I'll start taping the shows again, and they'll be uh, uh, broadcast taped but they can still all be downloaded out of the archive. I've been trying to debate on what to talk about tonight because I had two different times that I went partway through a subject and didn't get to finish it. Because on these talks that I'm giving, when I'm doing lectures, I will speak for over two to three hours on just one subject. So it's been hard to try to condense it down into one hour. So I had two that I'd started, but I think what I'm going to do tonight is complete the one I started last week. Because of Christmas, I began talking about the Jesus material. This is a material that is found in my two books that I wrote about Jesus. Uh, One is Jesus and the Essenes, and they walked with Jesus. And as you know, this information comes through my hypnosis work, when I, which I've been doing for 40 years, and it comes from the different clients when they go back through time and are actually in these time periods. 
And with the way I work, the person becomes the other personality totally. And these things are happening to them at that time. This life ceases to exist. They are the other person in that time period. So the information you can give is, is get from these people is really startling. It's like nothing that has been reported. One of the books that I'm thinking about writing in the future deals with history as it really was because of all the cases I've had of the different time periods. I found out that we don't know really what history was like. We just know what's come down to us, but we don't really know what was happening in these different time periods. So that's my job as a reporter to get this information back. And that's what I consider myself, the reporter, the researcher, and the investigator of lost knowledge. So I don't channel. I accumulate the information that comes through thousands and thousands of people. And this is what I write my books about, by putting it together. You get a little piece of information here, a little piece of information there, and you put it together like a gigantic puzzle. But the Jesus material was some of the very first uh, cases that I had, and it was back in the 1980s. And uh, I'm going to try to remember where I stopped last week, but um, the Jesus and the Essenes material came from a young woman who was an American and who had never even been out of the United States. She didn't even graduate from high school. She dropped out. She said they wanted her freedom, and you know, naturally, kids, when they get out, they find out it isn't free out there. So she ended up going into the Army so she could have an occupation, and she learned computers. This was in the 80s when it was just starting out. That was the extent of her education. But yet, when I worked with her, she went through 30 different lifetimes, covering all phases of history. So a lot of the other lives that I got from her are going to be reported in some of my other books. One of the other books that I wrote about this fascinating young woman was The A Soul Remembers Hiroshima. And in that past life, she relived the life of a Japanese man who was living outside of Hiroshima and was in the city of Hiroshima whenever the bomb was dropped. So here again, I was able to get lost information because there was not much information or any books written by what the people went through at that time. And that's what my job is to get back lost information, information that's either been forgotten or never known in the first place, or we've had bits and pieces and a lot of it's been changed as supplies to the Jesus material. And what is told in the Bible is not even half of the story. There's a whole lot more to the story that has never come down to us. And some of the parts of the story, I believe, are so beautiful and so full of miracles and wonder that they should be in the Bible. But a lot of it has not come down to us. A lot of it was removed or never inserted in the Bible in the first place. And remember, when I'm doing this Jesus material, I am very respectful of people's belief systems. And I'm not trying to go against anyone's belief system, but this is just adding material to what they already believe, realizing that you don't have all of the story. The young girl was the one who went back. She was only in her 20s. And when she went back through 30 different lifetimes, one of them being the one in Hiroshima, which was her last life before coming into this one, and we took her back through time, jumping back like a 100 years at a time. And that's why we ended up with so many lifetimes. I just didn't know what I was doing in those days, and I thought, well, it's been an interesting experiment. Of course, now... <laughs> I know, and you're going to find out when I do more talks in the future, now I know time is not linear. It is really parallel times and parallel dimensions, and things are all really all existing at the same time. But in those early days of my beginning, I was still thinking everything was linear, like one year after the other, one month after the other, 
our linear way of thinking, the way we go through life now. And I still prefer to think of it that way because otherwise it's a little too complicated for our poor little brains. <laughs> but um, I was jumping her back and back and back until finally we came to this life where she was an Essene teacher. And uh, at the time, I knew who the Essenes were because I remembered when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, in the caves by Qumran in Israel, back at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. And they said it was the greatest discovery in the history of mankind because it was the earliest known um, manuscripts, I guess you would say, of the Bible chapters. So it was a very valuable find, and the scholars all gathered over there, and they were trying to interpret these. But that's when everything began to get uh, to go downhill, because they began to find out that what they were finding in these old, old manuscripts was contradicting what the church was teaching. It was contradicting what was in the Bible. And when I did my research to write the book, Jesus and the Essenes, I had to read every book ever written on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I do this when I do research. I do tremendous amount of research, and I read every book ever written on the Dead Sea Scrolls to find out what they were coming up with. And one of them said, I wish you would just go away and come back in another generation because it was contradicting what they had been taught. Now, there was a board of people who were going over the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, the ones they had found, piecing them together, because many of them were in fragments, and trying to translate. They were very fragile. And as they began to get this, there was a, the board put up of different people who were the ones in charge of this. All of these were theologians. They all belonged to different churches. There was only one who was not a member of the church. And he was the one who revealed the real stories of what they were finding. He let things leak out too soon. They didn't want people to know these things because they were really getting frustrated and confused about it. And they were questioning their own belief system. This man began telling people what within the uh, scrolls they were translating. And he wrote several books. <laughs> His name is going to come to me in a minute because I wasn't prepared to mention it. Usually in a lecture I had it at the tip of my head, on my, my mind, but it'll come to me in a minute. But he wrote several books about the, his versions of what they were finding in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, when they found out that he was leaking this information, they put him off of the board. And he was never again allowed to even see the Dead Sea Scrolls and have any part in it because they didn't like the way he was uh, telling it too soon. And his, that way, we were able to get a true picture of what they were finding. But the rest of them all said, no, we're not going to reveal this. So it was like it was all shut up back in the caves again. Everybody kept thinking, what happened to this wonderful discovery that they said they had found? The greatest discovery in the history of man. What happened to this discovery? Well, there was no more heard about it. And it was only in the last few years, they said after 40 years of people saying, what's happening, that finally they're beginning to release some more of the information. And I can believe it's probably very select, very uh, just pieces of it that they're allowing people to know about. But one of them said, this can't be. There was Christianity before Christ. And, you know, the church has always said it all began with Christ, and that is not what we found. He actually got his teachings and his learning and his information from other groups, especially the mystery school called the Essenes that existed at that time at Qumran. They were, he was te taught by people. He was taught by the wisest teachers in the world. And this is where his uh, knowledge and his abilities came from. 
But the church wanted people to think he just appeared one day with all of this knowledge and abilities, like he came straight from God. That was not what happened at all. He was taught by people. And um, this is what I found when I was doing the regressions and putting it all together for the book. And it was later, after Jesus and the Essenes had been printed, and it had to come from England, because I was trying to get this published at a time when there wasn't any New Age bookstores. It was in the, uh, the 80s, and in the regular bookstores, they only had one more small shelf reserved for this kind of material. It was very difficult to get this kind of material printed. But everything has to happen in its time. So it ended up, the book Jesus and the Essenes was printed in England. And that's where it had to come. It had to come into the back door to get into America. So when I, the book was finally published, my publisher knew he was taking a chance. He told me he was. This was Alex Bartholomew, and he was with Gateway Publishers in England. And for many, many years before that, he worked in America, and he was the one that was responsible for publishing Jonathan Livingston Siegel, the uh, masterpiece that uh, is now, they're trying, you know, there was into a movie, and they're trying to get Richard Bach's Illusions now into a movie. But that was a, a original. He said at that time he was taking a chance because everybody said, this is a book about a, a seagull? doesn't make any sense. You're going to take a chance on that. But he was always willing to take chances, and his paid off when he was in the United States, and he was responsible for publishing Jonathan Livingston Seagull. When he founded his own company in England, and he'd been there for many years, and that was when he decided, he said, to take a chance on me and my book. He said, Jesus and the Essenes. He wasn't sure how it would be accepted, he thought people might ridicule it. They might not understand. They may not understand the method that it came about through hypnosis because this was in the days there wasn't much of this going around. But he said he decided to take a chance. Well, when he did, to his amazement, the book took off, and it went through several printings in England before it is now returned to the United States, and it, I have the rights back to it now, and it's being printed at another edition in the United States. But he always told me it was such a fantastic book. Well, after that, one time he called me and he said, do you have any more material about the life of Jesus? And I said, yes, I did. I had been accumulating some after that book was written. And he says, write it. But he said, I don't think you're going to be able to surpass a masterpiece. So I began to put together material that was other material that I got from two other women. Now, Jesus of the Essenes was the young girl going back to a lifetime where she was Sudi, one of the teachers, the Essene teachers at Qumran. And she was one of the ones that taught Jesus and John the Baptist um, the, their early days, all of the material they learned at Qumran. She was a master of the Torah. And I had to find out what all of this was. And I talked about this last week of what that was. That's the first five books of the Bible. And it talks about the Jewish law. And that was what she was in that past life. In this life, she was Pentecostal, and I said she had never even finished uh, high school. But here she was giving us Jewish teaching, theology, and Jewish culture customs. But then I had two other women that I was working with after that book was published, and they told us what it was like to be with Jesus when he was on his ministry giving it a totally different slant. Jesus and the Essenes is a, is a masculine energy. They walk with Jesus is a feminine energy. <laughs> because the one woman went back to where she was um, a wise woman who had been taught, I believe, by the Essenes, but she was in uh, the, the uh, temple in Jerusalem, 
and she was trying to teach there. Well, being a woman, the rabbis pushed her down and said, no, she wasn't worth it. They couldn't allow her to teach. So they let her teach the children. They figured she wouldn't do any damage there. And she was, all of her knowledge she felt was just going to waste. But in her experience, she met Jesus when he was uh, talking to the people on the steps of the great temple in Jerusalem. And we got a great deal of information about the temple and what it looked like and its construction. A lot of about that that proved to be true later. Where she was teaching the children with singing and dancing on the steps on one side of the temple, he was teaching to the people on the other side of the temple. So it talks about the miraculous experience she had with meeting Jesus at that time. Because she was so, felt so oppressed with all of this knowledge trapped up inside of her. And Jesus seemed to be able to recognize that as though it was a kindred soul. Because Jesus was also lonely and felt misunderstood. He felt he was in a time and place when people didn't understand what he was trying to say and rather lost. And here he had met someone who really understood and was also having to oppress great knowledge. So it's a wonderful story of their meeting. That's one of the women that is in They Walked with Jesus. The other one was a young Jewish girl in this life. She was raised Jewish, didn't even know anything about the story of Jesus or about his life or anything. So that was amazing that she was giving me the finishing up stories that she didn't even know, finishing the last pieces of a story she had no knowledge of. But to me, that gave it more validity because it wasn't like a Christian person saying, oh, I want to go back and live at the time of Jesus. This was a Jewish woman who had no idea about any of this. She said, later, it's almost comical. Why would I choose to have a life like that? But in that story, where she was reliving her life with Jesus, she was Jesus' niece. And this is where part of the lost history came in, was that Joseph, uh, Mary was not his first wife. He was married to someone else before that. And if you know the story, Joseph was much older than Mary. She was only about 16 when Jesus was born. And Joseph was a much older man. So it couldn't be hard to um, believe that he had had another wife. And the wife had died. That's where the story came out. And then it was later that he got with Mary and the the story of the birth of Jesus came about. But when he was married to the first wife, he had a son by the by her. And this son was called Joseph, which went along with the tradition over there. The first son is usually called named after the father. And this um, son, Joseph, lived in Jerusalem. And he, where Jesus was a carpenter, Joseph worked with metal. And so the two of them would work together many times. And he would come to this brother's house in Jerusalem and meet there and, and visit with him. He said the rest of the family didn't have much to do with this, with Joseph. Mary and the other uh, siblings, because, you know, Jesus had about nine brothers and sisters all together, which is another thing the church doesn't really like people to know about. But um, these other siblings in the family didn't have anything to do with this older brother. But Jesus wasn't that way. And whenever he would come into Jerusalem many times, he would stop and visit with him, and they had they worked together. Well, this girl went back to the lifetime where she was a child of Joseph, a young girl. And so this meant she was a niece of Jesus. 
And she would listen, she said, stay up late at night listening to them talking. And many times there would be disciples there, and she would listen to these things. And she had made up her mind that she wanted to go with Jesus, with her uncle, whenever he went on his next trip, because she wanted to be a part of all this. She believed in all of this. But in those days, all a girl could hope for was to get married. And that's what they were planning. She was just 13, and they were already planning that she would be married and be a wife and a mother because that's all a woman could look forward to. And she says she didn't want to hurt her family's feelings, but she said, I don't want to do that. I want to follow him. I want to do what he is doing. And one night, whenever he was there, she went to, to Jesus and she told him what she wanted to do. She wanted to follow him. And he looked at her and he said, you know, you can't do this. You're a woman. It's not allowed. But she said when she he looked in her eyes, he could see that she was sincere and she really did want to do this. So he talked to his brother and said, she really does want to do this. She doesn't want to disappoint you but she does want to follow me and go with the rest of the group as they were going around the countryside doing their ministry. Well, it, it was the story is very touching because he said in order for her to do this, she was going to have to cut her hair, disguise herself as a boy. That was the only way she would be safe traveling with this large group, and he didn't let anyone know she was related to him and he changed her name so they wouldn't know. So they walked with Jesus is the story of these two women and how this girl followed him with his group as they went to the different villages of the lepers at first. It's one of the first places they took him. And I always suspect Jesus did that on purpose because if she couldn't take it, he would immediately send her back Home. He would not let her go any further. <clears throat> she wasn't going to be able to take seeing these hor horribly disfigured people who had leprosy in those days. <clears throat> As you know, in those days, <clears throat> leprosy was a very feared disease, and they were the untouchables, and they put them away in villages all by themselves so that uh, they would have no association with the rest of the people who were considered healthy. And I think he took her there first just to see her reaction because it would have been a terrible shock for a young girl to see these things. Now, one thing I found was that when they were making these journeys, they, they were other people he took with him. One was John, the disciple, was, I guess you would say, the PR person. He would go ahead of Jesus and the rest of the group and set things up. He would arrange where they were going to stay. He would arrange where they were going to do the talks. And if there was any sign of danger, they had to divert their journey and go somewhere else. And many times in the, the story, in the book, they didn't meet in someone's house. They met in caves on the banks of uh, the Lake Galilee and the Jordan River. There were caves, and they would meet in these caves that had been hollowed out that would hold many people, and they would put brush and things over the entrances so no one would know they were meeting inside. And this is where he did a lot of his teachings. Well, John was the one that would go ahead and set up all of these, and then he would send word back that it's all right, you can come to this place and that place. I have it all set up. And um, uh, amazingly, uh, Judas had an important role that is not understood. Judas was the scribe. He was the one who was writing down all of the things that were happening. They always say there wasn't any records kept. Jesus, as far as I know, didn't write any records, but it was Judas's job to record all the things that were happening. 
and he tried to record the miracles. He tried to record the par the parables that Jesus would speak and to keep track of all these things. Now, after Judas uh, committed suicide at the, at the crucifixion, we don't know what happened to all these records. Is it possible that that is where some of the stories came down to us from? Is it possible that that is where the... Uh, the stories of the parables that Jesus spoke came from. Someone had to be recording these things. Otherwise, the books of the Bible were not written for hundreds of years after the death of Jesus. But what I found was one of the jobs of Judas was to be the recorder, the, uh, the scribe. And Jesus never condemned him either when he betrayed Jesus and... Um, made a suicide. He just knew that it was going to be very hard on him when he crossed over, that he was going, any time I found in my, I'm going to be going back later talking about next week, I think, finishing the story of life after death, that a suicide, you don't get out of it. If you whatever you're committing suicide for, you have to come back and repeat it again. You, this is a, a, a school on earth where you learn lessons. You can have to take a grade over, but you cannot skip a grade. And if you fail that grade, you have to go back and take it again. And that's what's happened. You have to put in the same circumstances again so that you will work it out. And sometimes it can even be worse the next time. And I've had many cases of this in my work. But anyway, Jesus just felt very sorry for him because he knew what his life was going to be like and the karma that he was incurring. But anyway, this is what they would do. They would go to the village of the lepers. Now, he also took other people with him besides the disciples and the followers. Shows this was very practical, almost like the Peace Corps. <laughs> he took uh, people with him who knew carpentry because when they went into the village of the lepers, a lot of these people were so ill they couldn't uh, keep up the building. So they would go in with a practical purpose, and they would be the carpenters who would make the repairs on the houses and try to make sure everything was okay. He also took some women with him. He liked to take positions when he could, but they were not always available. But he took women who had knowledge of uh, potions and medicine, especially different powders and how to make bandages and to salves and things that could be put on these people, their open sores. So it shows that he did not rely on his own abilities. He was practical. He took other people with him who could help. And this was what the story was, that this young girl saw all of these things. And he was t teaching all of his followers how to do the same things he was doing. He was teaching them healing. Because he had been taught all of these things by the Essenes. And when he taught them about healing, he would show them his hands. And he said, she would draw an imaginary circle in the center of her hand to show me what she, what he, she was talking about. <clears throat> she said, he, Jesus said, everyone has in the center of their palm a healing center. He didn't call it a chakra, but he said in the center of everyone's hand is a healing center. And they could heal by touching, and there would be energy come from their hands, and they could use it to heal. And as this girl watched when he would work on the lepers and work on the different people, she could see lights coming from his hands, and the light was powerful enough to heal. But you know, even Jesus couldn't heal everyone. I know the church likes to think that all he had to do was touch someone, and they were instantly healed. That may have been true, but he couldn't heal everyone. 
he had the ability to look at them and he could see their karma. He could see why they had the disease, why they had the illness. And then he would know, was it their karma that they had to work out? Maybe if it was, he couldn't heal because he would be interfering in their karma. In a case like that, the most he could do would be take away the, the pain and the suffering. He was very good at that. But he couldn't take the disease away if it was something the person had to experience. So this, this gives a different viewpoint to the way we look at Jesus. He taught people, you can do the same things I can do and even more. And this is what is said in the Bible. He taught them, you can do these things and more. He was not someone special, one of a kind. He was special, but he was not one of a kind, the only one who could do these things. He intended to teach everyone that you all have the abilities to do these things. That's where they have put him on a pedestal that he didn't want to be on. He wanted to show people you could do these things yourself. And there are many books written now about the healing hand and about the power of the energy in the hand. There's many different modalities of healing. Reiki and different ones where they are able to utilize the energy from the body to help heal the person. This is the kind of thing he was talking about, and it is very real and it is very powerful. But Jesus learned how to do all of these things when he was on his travels. This is where the missing years came in. And the Bible has the missing years, and they say nobody knows what happened during those missing years. Well, we found out what happened. He was traveling all over the world during those missing years. His uncle was Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph of Arimathea was related to Mary. Now, in the Bible, Joseph of Arimathea is only mentioned one time where he's talked about as being the rich man who gave up his tomb for Jesus after the crucifixion. Joseph of Arimathea is one of the most remarkable characters in the whole story, one of the most powerful characters in the whole Bible scene, and that's different at time period. It's a shame that he has been overlooked because his role was extremely important in the whole story of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was one of the richest men in the world at that time. He dealt in tin, and he was he got his tin in England, the tin mines in England. And I've received tons of information from that area where people have sent me books about the legends where everyone even today knows that about the tin mines, and they all know the stories and the legends of Joseph of Arimathea when he came and took the tin out of the mines for many, many years. Joseph of Arimathea had a huge fleet of ships that traveled all over the world, the known world at that time, taking the tin from the mines in England and taking them to the different uh, ports all around the world. Tin was almost as valuable as gold would be today. It was a very valuable metal, especially was used in the making of bronze. And as I did the research, the historians are not even sure how, where the tin came from in England. Now, it came out of the mines, but the way all of this was produced, they said it's very complicated. Somebody had to show them how to do this, these different things. They are convinced that the survivors of Atlantis would have been the ones that settled in the British Isles and developed all of these uh, different techniques. And this is probably where the Druids came from also, the survivors of Atlantis, because the Druids were, had the biggest university in the known world at that time, a tremendous university at, Gla at Glastonbury, where they taught all the different subjects, just the same as the Essenes did. The Essenes taught all of the subjects that were known. 
In Jerusalem, in Israel, all the pers- the boy was were taught was just um, mathematics and reading and writing and the Torah. They weren't taught anything else. The girls were just taught how to be a wife and a mother. They were not even taught to read and write. If a boy wanted to have more education, he had to go somewhere else to get the training. But at Qumran, in their mystery school, they had they were taught everything. Mathematics, astrology, um, they were they were different masters. And this is where the one we were speaking to in Jesus in these scenes was the masters of the Torah. But there was one that was called, there was a woman teacher who was called the, the, the master of the mysteries. She knew uh, how to teach Jesus and the other students that were there different methods of healing. And they said, when you completed all that was taught in uh, Qumran, which was supposed to take about 20 years, most students came in and focused on one subject, like mathematics or astrology, but it would take about five years. Jesus had to learn it all, everything that was taught at that school. And they said, when you completed all of the courses that the Essenes were teaching, you would even know how to raise the dead. Those were for the highly advanced people, students that took all of these courses. So Jesus was exposed to a tremendous amount of knowledge just with the Qumran alone. But in between there, Joseph of Arimathea was taking him to all the other wise teachers of the world. He was taking them under the disguise uh, as traveling with his uncle because his uncle had to go and trade in these different countries. And Jesus went along with him under that disguise. And when Jesus was young, Mary would also go with him. She would accompany him on these trips. And no one knew the real reason he was taking him to these countries was so he could meet the various wise teachers in India, Tibet, uh, the Druids in England. Uh, they said uh, China, it was not called China in those days. But all of the wise teachers of the world, he would spend time with them and learn everything they had to teach. And he could absorb it so quickly. He, he could just learn so fast. That was the amazing thing that what would normally take 20 years, if he would spend a year there, he would have all of the information absorbed. He could put it all together. His mind was that capable of grasping everything. So he was taught by all the wise teachers of the world. And then when he came back, he developed his own technique by putting all of this together, making it work for him all the different secrets that he had been taught. It's interesting to know that Mary Magdalene, many people have asked me about her. She was one of the disciples. Jesus had more women followers than he had men. And it was unusual for that day because women were very restricted in what they could do. But he found that women could understand what he was teaching easier than men. Because of our intuitive nature, we could pick up on it much easier, where the men were more practical. And this has all been removed from the Bible, that he had many women followers, and he had women disciples. And Mary Magdalene was one of these women disciples. Now, people have asked me, did they have a relationship? Were they married? I have never found anything about him being married, because... What I found was that he felt if he got if he was married, it would take away from what he was doing. He could not devote himself totally to what his job was, what his mission was, if he was married and had a family. This is one of the reasons he was very lonely. But he had a relationship with Mary Magdalene in a special way. I don't know anything about a sexual relationship. But Mary Magdalene was a highly educated woman. She was an Egyptian priestess. 
And she had been taught in Egypt in all of the mysteries and all of the things that Jesus had been taught. So she was very uh, well versed in all of this, the healing methods and all of the metaphysical knowledge. So Jesus spent a lot of time with her because they could talk on the same level and converse about these different things. And the other disciples, some of them were jealous of her, especially Peter was jealous that Jesus spent so much time with her. And they tried to discredit her in many ways because they didn't like the idea that they spent so much time together. But uh, Mary Magdalene was a very special person, and she had a very special role to play also after the death of Jesus, whenever uh, she helped to pump the first church in the world. So a lot of this is lost knowledge that has been taken out of the Bible, never put in there in the first place. And they're always saying women can't be priests because Jesus didn't have any women disciples. And I said, whoa, that's not true. That's what they'd like to let you have you believe. But Jesus did not distinguish to him. At Qumran, they had women teachers. He was raised with this. In other countries in the world, he was taught by women. So him, he didn't distinguish between women being lower than men. So he had many women followers, but the church doesn't want that knowledge known. So that is why they're still saying, no, women can't be priests. But he respected women a great deal. Oh, there's so much to this story. But there are many other parts that have been removed from the Bible. One of them was that um, when he began his ministry in Jerusalem, they was afraid that he was attracting so much attention, the Romans were afraid that he was going to call, be causing a rebellion and that the Jews would rise up and follow him. And they were very afraid of this because he was getting more and more popular. So many times he was captured and he was taken into the rooms and the tunnels that are underneath the temple in Jerusalem. Some of these tunnel, tunnels survive to this day. They're still down there. All that remains of the temple today is the tunnels underground and the water system that has survived since the time of Jesus that uh, you know, supplies the water to the whole area and the lower part of the Wailing Wall. Everything else was destroyed by the Romans uh, after the crucifixion whenever they came in and destroyed all of Jerusalem. But he would take, he was captured and he was taken down into these tunnels where he would be tortured and beaten, trying to make him stop what he was doing. He refused to do it. When he was let go, he would go right back to doing the same things again, trying to teach people and trying to do what he thought was his mission. So on one occasion, they captured him. After torturing him, they decided they had to kill him. They put him into a crate, and they threw him over a cliff, and it would have killed any normal person, but Jesus survived. This frightened the Romans even more, because they found they couldn't kill him. And you know, in the Bible, it says, whenever he died, he said, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. He wasn't going to die until he was ready to die, until his mission was completed. But it was after that attempt was when the disciples, they all decided to leave Jerusalem, go out into the countryside and travel and preach there and do the ministry and teach people about uh, metaphysics, about meditation, about healing, and to spread the gospel of love. He did it out in the countryside, and that was where he did his travels, because it was dangerous in Jerusalem. This explains the part in the Bible. You know what? The Romans weren't interested in following him out there, and they certainly weren't going to go into the villages of the lepers to hunt him down. He was good ridden once he was out of Jerusalem. But this explains why in the Bible it says when on Palm Sunday, when he came back into Jerusalem, that the disciples knew it was dangerous. 
they said you could be killed. It never explained that in the Bible. But he could be killed because he was coming back into an area where they had tried several times to get rid of him and kill him. And they knew it was dangerous. But by that time, Jesus had decided and he knew the time was coming when he was to leave the body. He said that... uh, It was all right until his own people began turning against him. Then he knew his mission was over and it was time for him to leave. And that went into the story then of his capture and the uh, crucifixion. But here we are running out of time again. (laughs) And I haven't even finished most of that story. But to me, these are wonderful stories that I think should be in the Bible. They're the rest of the stories, the missing pieces. When I began to do my research, I was quite familiar with the Bible because I taught Sunday school for many years. And I thought when I began to do my research, this was after I'd completed all of the sessions, and I knew at that time it was safe to do the research because I wasn't going to be influencing her in any way. I did the research. I thought I was going to find all the answers in the Bible. I didn't. There were many missing gaps, big holes where information was just not there. That's when I think with the work I've done has filled these gaps for the first time and told people the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey always said. (laughs) So that's uh, the part. I'll bring it up to that part anyway because there's even more missing parts. Maybe we can continue next week on this same story. I can get all the information out, and then I want to go into some other parts that I've started and not finished. I think you can see why I've spoken for a week in many places, speaking on all the different parts of all of my books. But if you're interested in the books, I want to check out where I'm going to be speaking. You can check it out on our website, which is Ozark Mountain, www. Name my company is Ozark Mountain Publishing. So it's Ozark Mountain and it's abbreviated. O Z A R K M T dot com. And you can check on the part about the schedule to know where I'll be speaking and to find out about my classes. But if anyone is interested in a private session or my classes, or if they want me to speak at any conference or anything, you can contact my office at 1-800-935-0045. 1-800-935-0045. Or you can contact me by email. It is D-E-Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N, at M-S-N dot com. All right, goodbye till next time. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.